We are also recording. Great. Well, wait, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for this Thursday, September 3rd meeting of the Land Use and Natural Resource Subcommittee for SACOG. Um, if you would all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's see, Lynette, would you please go ahead and call roll? Yes, thank you. Uh, just before I do that, just a couple of housekeeping uh, mentions. Um, we all know that this meeting is being recorded. That was just announced. Uh, members of the public who are participating by telephone can press star nine if they'd like to make a comment, and that includes any of our board members who are participating via telephone as well. Um, we would ask our board members participating um, either by phone or on Zoom if you can mute your device when you're not speaking. And then um, also board members are welcome to use the raise hand feature as well as members of the public if you're using the Zoom feature online as well. Uh, for roll call, Director Flores is absent. Frost? Here. Thank you. Jankovitz? Absent. Kennedy? Here. New? I see Director New has joined us online, so I'll note him present for the record. On Derco? Absent, West? Here. Vice Chair Gallardo? Yes. Vice Chair Tixa? Here. And Chair Spokely? Here. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette. Muted. You're muted, well, Chair Spokely. You're sorry, muted. Director Spokely, you were. I missed it. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, I know you mentioned a few minutes ago that we didn't have any, as of then, public communications. Just checking back in. Do we have any at this time? No, I don't have any public comment. Great. Thank you very much. We'll go ahead and move on to our first action item, which is the approval of minutes from our August 6, 2020 committee meeting. Do we have any comments from the directors or a motion? Move to approve. This is Director I'll West. Second. Director West first, Tisa second. Lynette, I think we have to do a roll call because we're online. Yes, thank you. Director Flores absent. Frost? Uh, here. Yes. Yes, thank you. Jankovitz? Here. Er, yes. Thank you. Kennedy? Here. New? Uh, I'm here. Hi, D Director New, could you indicate your vote of I or nay on the approval of the minutes? Hi, Director New. Hopefully you can hear me. If you can indicate aye or nay on the approval of the minutes. Okay, I'll come back to him. And Director Kennedy, was your vote on the minutes an aye? Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay, thank you. Just want to make sure I've got it straight for the record. Uh, Director Anderko is absent. West? Aye. Vice Chair Gallardo? Aye. Vice Chair Tixa? Yes. Chair Spokely? Yes. And then going back to Director New, if you can hear me, if you can indicate aye or nay for the minutes. Aye. Aye. Thank aye. you. Thank you. Motion carries. Aye. Aye. We, 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 we got you, Director New. Thank you very much. 
Uh, we you. will go ahead and move on to our next item. That's the release of the draft Mather Airport Land Use Compatibility Plan update for public review. I believe, Gregory, you'll take this, but I, I think this is the item that we have a special guest joining us today to make an introduction. Is that correct? Hi, Hi um, Chair Spokely. We actually have a Director Sander who will be providing an update on the Commercial Corridor Task Force item. That's oh. number four, so that's in a few minutes. Sorry about that. Thank that's you. okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, Is that on? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, um, so uh, one of the, uh, this item is to bring forward whether or not the uh, committee will forward to the board uh, the release of the airport land use compatibility plan for Mather Airport. Uh, one of the things that uh, the St. Cog board serves as, but doesn't hear a lot about, is its role as airport land use commission. Um, and. Basically, uh, the Airport Land Use Commission uh, state law uh, requires that uh, for every public use airport uh, in the state uh, that there is some sort of compatibility plan of the land uses surrounding the airport to the airport. And the state law designates SACOG and our counterparts throughout the state to serve as the Airport Land Use Commission. The role of the board specifically is to uh, coordinate the airport planning um, compatibility to adopt uh, the plans, which is what you're here for today, uh, and then to review local land use plans near airports. Uh, so in the SACOG role as the Airport Land Use Commission only serves uh, the four counties of Sacramento, Sutter, Yolo, and Yuba. Uh, El Dorado and Placer uh, have, each have their own airport land use com um, commissions. So specifically what's in the plan, um, it basically what's the role of it? It's to ensure that we have land uses that are compatible uh, with surrounding airports, uh, surrounding the airports. Uh, it contains, the major components are to make sure uh, those land uses are compatible from noise, safety, height, which is airspace protection, and overflight notification, which is perceived uh, disturbances. Um, one critical thing about these plans, it does not deal with the operations of what goes on at the airport or the facilities on the airport. It's about what goes on, uh, the uses surrounding that. As your staff, uh, we bring to you uh, policies and particularly in the form of this plan. Uh, and then uh, with the adopted plans, uh, what we do is we work with uh, your local agencies. We review individual applications for development surrounding airports with your staff. And then uh, we determine consistency recommendations. Uh, and then we also coordinate with Caltrans. Caltrans is the agency that uh, that manages from the state standpoint that we're accountable to. Your local jurisdictions, uh, they update their land use plans to be consistent with the, uh, the airport plans. Uh, they coordinate with us here at SACOG, uh, and then uh, they submit individual development applications. Uh, if a review comes in uh, back to a jurisdiction that the jurisdiction says we really need that project, then two thirds of the governing body can override that uh, following uh, procedures in state law. So why are we here uh, for this item, specifically with Mather? Uh, meet the Mather uh, Airport Land Use Compatibility Plan was last updated in 1997. Uh, so it's a little bit more than 20 years old. The life of these plans are roughly about 20 years. Uh, also, uh, the master plan um, for the airport, that's again, the operations of the airport and what goes on in the facilities on the airport property. That was recently done in the last few years uh, by the airport operator. In addition, just uh, there's been changes to operations and the type of uh, air, uh, plane vehicles that, uh, that use that airport. So we just wanna get this, uh, our airport plan updated Plus there's a lot of development planned for uh, around uh, Mather, particularly along the Jackson Highway. And then finally, um, and most importantly, is the airport op is operated and owned by Sacramento County Department of Airports. Uh, they are requesting that we do this and they're also paying for SACOG staff time as well as our consultants time. So what's in the, uh, uh, in the plan? Uh, we have general policies about roles and responsibilities uh, but really the heart of it is what's the compatibility? What, 
uh, what standards do we have about uh, what can be uh, developed and where in relation to the airport. Plus, we have a lot of background information uh, in the appendices. So the plan, uh, once we pull apart the individual compatibility factors, uh, the big two are really here uh, on safety and noise. Uh, those are the ones that uh, the ones that are most perceivable. Um, and uh, uh, but we also have airspace protection. That's really height, and if uh, particularly if a cell tower is the most applicable thing, uh, most common thing, but if a cell tower is going to go up, uh, there's certain places that it's better to be at than others if it's going to be near an airport and it depends on the height. Uh, and then we have other, uh, other issues such as um, uh, wildlife hazards and uh, over perceived overflight issues. So specifically in this plan, uh, noise is um, this is one of the two biggest factors with any airport plan. Uh, so we measure uh, what the, uh, based on future plans, what the uh, theoretic capacity of uh, the noise is. Uh, we have different contours based on that. And then with, with those contours, uh, we create uh, a plan. Uh, a plan contains um, a table that shows different land uses that would be in the jurisdiction. And then we identify, depending on where they fall within those contours, whether or not they're allowed or not. So green would be allowed, mm. yellow would be conditionally allowed, and red is prohibited. So we try to do that for every anticipated um, um, land use. Uh, safety is the other uh, uh, big factor. So we identify the uh, six different safety zones uh, based on uh, statistical probability of if there's going to be a crash, where is it most likely going to be? Um, um, closer to the runway and at the end of the runway is the most statistically likely place, but there's other places that will be. Uh, so we have different zones uh, and then with each zone uh, we have different uh, standards for what land uses can be uh, allowed or not. Uh, again, it all gets wrapped up into um, different areas uh, and then um, for review. So the, uh, this shows the overall um, eastern portion of Sacramento County. Uh, the dark orange is the areas particularly affected by safety and noise. Those are the really important, the most critical ones. But the lighter orange is also uh, areas of, of uh, where the navigation easements are. Uh, it's already a requirement uh, in the current uh, in current um, regulations right now, and it will just continue uh, for those areas. Navigation easement basically is if you were to have build new housing, uh, that you would just sign a form recognizing that there's an airport somewhere within the vicinity. So uh, the plan um, was developed over the last two years, and we want to make sure that those jurisdictions that are most uh, uh, adjacent to the airport uh, or in the vicinity uh, were involved with it. So we have the land use planners from those jurisdictions help us develop this uh, plan. Um, so the cities of Rancho Cordova and Folsom, uh, Sacramento County, El Dorado County, um, the school district of uh, Elk Grove, as well as the uh, Caltrans Division of Aeronautics. And again, I should note that Caltrans provides a handbook for how these uh, these uh, plans are to be developed. Uh, they provide the guidance for what goes into the use tables and what's allowed or not. They also uh, provide guidance on how the, the safety zones were developed. Um, so in addition, as we we're developing it, uh, we had um, contacted uh, anybody, any uh, public agency that was within those orange areas that I showed you on the previous maps. Uh, special districts, uh, any any uh, local agency, and we met with them uh, just to tell them what's going on. In addition, we've been in discussions with all the major developments uh, that would be affected by this plan, uh, particularly those along the Jackson Highway area. So you're being asked as a committee to uh, um, to move forward this to the to the full board serving as the Airport Land Use Commission. And it's just to release the, um, the draft plan so that, that we can start getting comments on it. We've only been working with stakeholders. There's a big, bigger, broader public out there. 
that could give us input on this. Uh, if the board does, uh, the board and the committee do agree to do that, then um, uh, we would be collecting comments for a, a month's time, and then uh, we would be preparing the uh, development displacement analysis and the CEQA documents uh, throughout the uh, remainder of the year, and then bring back this to the SACOG board uh, and this committee in December. Uh, after that, then we would release the um, uh, the secret documents uh, and then also do a 30 day review in the early spring and then bring this back to the board uh, and the committee in April. So with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Um, and also, if there is a, a really technical question, uh, our consultant, uh, Chris Jones, uh, will raise his hand and enter through through that process. Thank, thank you very much, Gregory. Can, can you go back to slide number 12? Okay, this one? So, so this is kind of a vertical um, area of influence, I guess, as, as you gain elevation, right? That's what that graphic is showing. Is, uh, yeah, this shows different planes of, of uh, so we have the safety layer, and then we have on top of that a noise layer uh, and these other layers. Uh, so combined, uh, when you put it all together and you look at it in a two-dimensional map, uh, this is uh, where it goes. Perfect. So, so back on slide 12, where, where does the dude with a jetpack come into, come into these uh, various planes uh, as it goes vertically? Okay. So uh, my understanding that, is- that, that was a joke, by yeah, the way. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, too long of a lead up for it, but uh, the guy down in Los Angeles and his jetpack 3,000 feet over the airport was quite something to hear about. Yeah. I, I, I do have some serious questions for you. The airports, uh, historically, certainly our airport that, or the airports that we have up in Placer County are under our um, um, agencies uh, review and approval for their land use plans, the compatibility plans, but there, there always seems to be a tension with, with encroaching and, and densification of development around, around these safety zones. Um, I noticed in your presentation, you talk about the outreach uh, with developers working on major projects in and around these airport zones. Was, was there, was there a healthy input from developers in this process? Uh, yes, so uh, here's the safety zones that we have. Uh, we've been, uh, we identified before we even started the project, uh, those uh, development areas that are under current planning right now, there's four of them specifically uh, on kind of the south side. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving or not. Yeah, yeah, I can see. Uh, okay, so uh, along here, and specifically the West Jackson uh, master area plan, there's a couple of developments, uh, the Tiger property and the Granite properties. Um, so we've been in communication with them. Uh, they have, uh, they uh, know of our plans, we know of their plans, and we tried to mesh them together. And I think we've done a pretty good job of resolving most issues. Um, and uh, the Granite should not have an issue uh, with the exception of, uh, they do have some detention ponds and we don't like wildlife being near airport runways. Uh, so they're working with the county about what the design is of that. Uh, the Tykert property also, uh, we've been working with them on their plans. So we're gonna be meeting with them. We've been meeting with them uh, through Sacramento County airports and planning departments. And uh, um, again, most issues have been resolved. There's, we just wanna make sure our maps exactly uh, match up so that um, they're compatible. Great. Thank, thank you, Gregory. I'll go ahead and open it up to other directors that might have questions on this item. Lynette, do you see any hands up in from the I, attendees? I don't see any hands up or any public comment. Okay. Um, we, do, we don't have, do we have any outside public comment on this item, Lynette? No, we don't. Okay. Uh, any comments? 
If not, I'll entertain a motion. I'll to make a motion to approve staff's recommendation. I'll second that motion. So we have a motion and a second. I just want to make sure that we're all clear. We're just recommending the release of the draft um, Mather Airport Land Use Compatibility Plan for public review back to the full SACOG board. That's correct. Lynette, do you want to go ahead and call roll? Yes, thank you. Director Flores, absent. Frost? Aye. Ginkovitz? I'll come back to him. Oh, sorry, Director Ginkovitz? Uh, yes. Thank you. Kennedy? Aye. New? Aye. Anderko? Absent. West? Aye. Vice Chair Gialdo? Aye. Vice Chair Tixa? Yes. Chair Spokley? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll move on to our informational items. First up there is item number three, Regional Early Action Plan Funding Update. I see Jennifer has this one. Yep, good afternoon. You'll remember back in June that the full board with the recommendation from this committee approved our final framework for how we will spend our regional early action planning funds or the REAP funds. Um, since this is the home committee overseeing the REAP program, we just wanted to bring you periodic updates on the progress of the program and the, the money that the funds that are being expended. So for today's update, I will just touch on a few highlights and note that there is more detail in your staff report. Um, but again, just a, just a quick update. So you'll recall that we applied to HCD for the first 25% of the REAP funds back in April. And I'm happy to say that we have actually now received those funds and we are making good progress on getting those funds um, ready to go out the door to your agencies. You'll recall that um, we're using some of these early, the majority of these early action um, early access funds to pass through to local agencies specifically to support your housing element updates. So Greg Chu on our staff has been in contact with all of your staff and is working on the necessary uh, MOUs and paperwork and getting those signed so that we can um, start getting invoices in hopefully as soon as next month. So that's all moving along really well. From this early set of funds, we also are um, using a portion of it to support the teams from last year's Civic Lab. Recall that was focused on commercial corridors and so where um, those teams have identified um, projects or plans for increased housing on the corridor, which is the alignment with the REAP funds. Um, they will be getting some funds to get going on that as well. So Adrian Moretz, our Civic Lab project manager, has been in contact with all of those teams. And I believe many are beginning uh, work, be set up to begin work now as well. And then looking forward um, to the remaining set of the REAP funds, the, the remaining 75% of funds. We're hoping to apply to HCD for those funds next month. That's a little bit later than we anticipated. Back in June, we were, back in June, we discussed um, a framework for how we would be spending those 75% of funds. And I shared a draft calendar that anticipated us applying to HCD around September timeframe. Um, and, but at the time and still, we noted there's a lot of variables at play with these REAP funds. So the calendar is flexible and it's going to experience these changes over time. So right now we think we'll probably apply um, to HCD sometime in October rather than September for these remaining funds. However, technically we have until January to do so. So we're not at risk for missing that deadline and getting these funds to our region. Additionally, applying in October versus September does not have a significant impact on the adopted framework for how we plan to use these funds. 
per the adopted framework, the funds um, are for a combination of non-competitive and competitive grants, as well as a technical assistance program to really support the efforts of the local agencies. And that technical assistance program also includes the new civic lab housing series that will be kicking off. So I'll touch on these three components just very briefly. Um, because even all along the calendar has been that we will be the, doing a lot of prep and planning for these activities, but anticipated that the funds would not be available for distribution until early 2021. And I believe that is still the case. So for the non-competitive grant, the framework outlined a very simple application process, um, really more of a notification process that we will still start later this year in anticipation of um, having funds available early next year. And then you'll recall there was uh, $1.7 million of the REAP funds dedicated to a competitive grant program to support green zones. That was approved in concept in the framework, but also was acknowledged that we needed to still flesh out those details and come back to this committee and the transportation committee with more detail about it. Um, as you all know, the regional transportation funding round is a very active discussion right now. So we're still figuring out if or how the competitive REAP funds fit into to this committee next month with more details on that particular piece of the REAP framework. And then finally, we are continuing to still plan the Civic Lab House. technical assistance in early 2021 when the full funding is available. Hey, um, hey. And that's just a, a brief update. No action from you needed today, but Je Jennifer, Le Lynette, am I the only one that's losing her? Uh, no, I think I was just going to ask Jennifer, if you want to turn off your screen, that might help with the internet connection. But I, I think she was about to ask if any of you had questions, but I don't want to speak for her. Yes, that's where I'm at. I'm sorry I cut out a lot, huh? <laughs> yes, so Jennifer, the last couple of minutes, kind of your closing there was all that we didn't hear. Do you want to try to restate that for us? Jennifer, I think you were just about to introduce the Civic Lab housing series um, coming up. Okay. Thank, thank you, Glenn. Yeah, Thanks. The Civic Lab Housing Series, we still intend to do those four workshops, uh, virtual workshops this fall. And we'll start with some of the technical assistance, but really the plan would be to wrap, uh, ramp that technical assistance up uh, more significantly in early 2021 when the full funds become available to us. Um, and so that, that's really the last update there and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank, thank you very much. Sorry about the connection issue there. The, the, the question I've got, and I'll start real quick here. Um, the the non-competitive grant funds, um, are, are those the funds, and I'm trying to recall the exact framework, um, but are those the funds that are distributed based on population? They were actually distributed based on the RENA, the Regional Housing Needs Allocation that the board passed um, earlier this year. So there was um, like varying thresholds and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but you know, roughly if you were within, you know, one to 3% of the regional, if you had one to 3% of the units, you got X amount and then three to five. And so the, the amount sort of ramped up as the amount of units allocated under the arena per jurisdiction ramped up. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I do recall that now that you mentioned that. Um, do any of the directors have questions for Jennifer on this item? I'm seeing none. Do, do we have any public comment on this item, Lynette? I don't see any public comment. Okay, great. 
Jennifer, thank you very much for, for the information on that item. We do appreciate it. Uh, the next item we have is an update on the Commercial Corridors Task Force meeting recap. And this is the item where we have uh, Director Sander who's going to make, uh, get, provide the update to us. Uh, Mr. Chair, we did have uh, Director Sander uh, ready to go. I'm, I think, you know, in the time of Corona, conflicts come and arise, and I know he's got kids at home, so um, he's not able to join us. So I will. Um, pick up the torch, if that's okay with you. Yes, please, absolutely. Great, and um, okay. I do wanna acknowledge- I okay. <laughs> I do as well. Uh, I do wanna acknowledge uh, our member from the task force also on here, uh, uh, Director Gallardo. Uh, please feel free to jump in if you want to um, provide some additional comments. So uh, I'll, I'll be brief, but the agenda really was focused on when we're looking at infill, what are some of the unintended consequences to that infill on the community? So our agenda started with, with a welcome and some local updates. We then um, gave a brief summary from James on the race equity and inclusion working group that the board launched uh, and how that dovetails with the work around anti-displacement while investing in communities. And then we had a presentation from Dr. Miriam Zook at Enterprise Community Partners She's uh, had a former professor from UC Berkeley, so she's gone from the academic side of studying these issues of displacement to the practitioner side now. Um, and then we dove into some specifics on that. Dov Kadem gave us a great presentation. And then we went through the draft policymakers toolkit, which I'm gonna give more detail. I just wanted to run through the agenda that Jennifer and Dov and Rosie from SACOG are all collaborating on. And then Jennifer provided us uh, the task force an update on the regional early action funds as well as the green zones. And just a reminder that this task force is members of our SACOG board and then also members from the private and nonprofit development community. Uh, so we have folks who do market rate housing, infill housing, affordable housing, greenfield housing, which really helps us to have a lot of perspectives and a, a great deliberative uh, discussion for every item, quite frankly. Uh, so in the updates, we heard that the city of Sacramento was initiating their specific plan for the Stockton Boulevard corridor. Uh, and they are looking specifically at anti-displacement and affordable housing. Uh, and then we heard uh, Mayor Sean Harris updated us on the bridge opening between Yuba City and Marysville and really the opportunity that lies there uh, connecting those two cities and that commercial corridor and really driving, you know, business back and forth across that, that bridge. And then one of our members uh, shared a story of a new project that she is working on in the city of West Sacramento that is preparing for plan review. And she coined this term attainable housing. So this is a, a, rental, a rental case study for SACOG as well one of the things that she really talked about was the challenge of the square footage versus a per unit fee and the per unit fees that are coming with her uh, multi-unit product compared to if it was uh, less units but still uh, the same uh, less units but lower fees so it was really uh, interesting dialogue that fits into our policymakers toolkit so i'll touch on that again some more so first item was the presentation uh, by Dr. Zook. And early on uh, in our question and answer, we, there were very probing questions around the metrics and how do we you know, support communities. And what was really evident was that there wasn't an easy button for that tension that comes with gentrification, which can be seen as a good thing when you are investing in these disadvantaged or historically left behind communities that maybe lack the infrastructure to make them walkable or bikeable. And uh, with that, it's very context sensitive. So when you're looking at your community, uh, one thing we kind of uh, heard about is how do we create a set of metrics across our region that, you know, SACOG staff could potentially help create and then just apply that. And what was clear from the discussion is it's, it's just not that simple and that us, the staff, the local staff, 
really need to understand the historical contents, context, but be on the ground to really understand what is in the fabric of the community today and what are those priorities for preservation. And I'll, I'll say preservation with a, a lowercase p, not a historical preservation, but what are the underlying businesses, the community that's there and what are their needs? One example that, that she used uh, for equitable development was the three Ps, tenant protections, which have um, a variety of tools within there, preservation of existing affordable housing and production of new housing. Uh, and again, it was a very lively discussion. Um, there will be a full meeting summary. I, I failed to note that at the beginning of the presentation at the receive and file for the board this month. We uh, weren't able to turn that around as a handout today. So that will also include copies of the presentations and links to referenced videos that, um, and other information that Dr. Zook provided to us. So um, when we went further in to the anti-displacement strategies, um, this was the chance for the members of the task force to really kind of dig in on what is most promising to invest in new communities help people stay in the homes and or grow with the investment as well so that they are able to see multiple benefits while still bringing in new outside residents, younger, just diversifying. Uh, and uh, the anti-displacement strategies are gonna be part of that policymakers toolkit, which is the big deliverable for this group. You might recall that this uh, kicked off in early 2020 it was set for a one-year task force with this deliverable of a policymaker's toolkit. So really, what are the various levels across a spectrum of topics that policymakers could use as levers to facilitate infill on commercial corridors? One of the things that our chair, uh, Chair Sander, coined was this idea of a healthy ecosystem around these corridors that the corridors currently that, that are the ones that are struggling are, are relying on external stimulus. So people driving in to these destinations and they haven't created a healthy e ecosystem where businesses and schools are supported by the nearby community. A really interesting dialogue occurred around that topic of how do you continue to leverage your existing typically locally owned businesses and that tension of the, the great benefit that comes with the new big box developments. And I don't want to put words into Chair Sanders' mouth, but he described this tension of their civic center and really looking for other really big investments as opposed to looking at some of the smaller businesses in place and, and growing. That also led to a discussion of transit-oriented development. And one of the conflicts that uh, the city is facing is on a TOD area, they have a proposal for a drive through And it's a drive through that would feel very desirable for residents. So they know that residents would be attracted to the potential business, but it's in conflict with the city's goals around creating more walkable, bikeable destinations on their transit-oriented uh, transit priority areas. So I don't want to go on too long, but there really was tremendous amount of engagement from the private sector. Uh, the, the story of the, the per unit per square foot fees um, was quite interesting. And one thing that Chair Sander also noted in our session is the need to hear and capture those stories. And so we as your staff certainly heard that and noted that. Um, bringing that expertise from the private sector side to talk about the challenges uh, is, is really important. Another point that I thought was very interesting and informative to us was the idea of building more attainable housing to take the burden off of local jurisdictions to rely on publicly subsidized housing, that that is just a cycle that is very difficult for many, uh, many jurisdictions to, to maintain Public house, publicly subsidized housing over time, and what do new types of housing products, particularly on these commercial corridors, look like in the future, and how do we um, use 
the Policy Lover tools to help clear a path for developers to draw in new types of housing production, um, new types of businesses that are kind of locally grown or fostered from our own uh, communities in place. So I'll, I'll pause right there. I, that's really just a snapshot of a, a highly interactive two hour meeting, uh, but I'll pause right there for questions or comments or if um, Director Gallardo wanted to add any more that she thought might be prudent. Thank, thank you very much, Monica. Uh, Jill, would you like to speak on this item at all? Thank you. Uh, you did such a great job covering it all. I think the piece that just really stood out to me was the, the private sector input. It has been just top notch and very enlightening. And I think so specific that it's really been helpful for me to get some of those challenges. Um, other than that, I think she got it covered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else have questions for Monica on this item? I'm not seeing any, Monica. I do have a couple items that I wanted to cover. Um, you mentioned a few times in your presentation the Policymakers Toolkit. That, that's something that you're working on putting together through, through this task force? Yes. So uh, Jennifer, who you heard from earlier, and Dov Caden and Rosie Ramos from our, our team are working on that. So it is in a current draft form. It will actually come through to the Lunar Committee. This is kind of the place where the commercial task, uh, commercial court or task force we report through this venue. Um, and we're anticipating a release or that document to be final in December. So I believe, and if Jen's still here, she can jump in, that the, the timing would be a preview here in November at this committee with a, a full release uh, and uh, to Director Gallardo's point, the specificity that we are getting from the developers, I think, is, is really significant. Uh, it's been tremendously useful to us as a staff to drive the research, to drive where we need to put more emphasis. And if you remember back, because we did report on the very first meeting of the Commercial Corridor Task Force, we asked we staff prepared a draft list of what we knew as um, kind of topical barriers that we heard from infill from our perspective and working with your local staff. And so we had factors within the social fabric. So some of the issues around homelessness, safety perceived or real, safety with infrastructure, lack of infrastructure, unclear processes. So we had feedback from both our leadership, our board, and then the task force members on which were the most challenging in the years to come that they anticipated. And so staff was able to point in that area. Uh, so you're gonna see a menu of a variety of strategies uh, to come forward that um, are really informed by the private and nonprofit sector. Um, Monica, was, was this meeting recorded? Is it, something it was, and I will provide the link in the meeting summary to the meeting, and I'm going to look at Lynette, and if there's an immediate follow-up, we can just include that in today's follow-up as well, but it will be in the meeting notes. Great, and, we're, and those meeting notes will be at our, at our will, board meeting, our September board meeting? Correct, on the receive and file calendar. Perfect. That's great. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, you mentioned anti-displacement policies. Um, so, clarify what, what that is for me. Sure, so I would say, um, I should correct myself, anti-displacement strategies is really where we were focusing. Um, it is a, a, an extremely difficult topical area. Um, there's, I just keep hearing, you know, there's no easy button. But the idea is that typically when investments are coming into disadvantaged communities, and that could mean you know, low income, underinvested, lacking the infrastructure, that with that investment, oftentimes the, mm. the new folks who are coming in are higher income, and then the businesses start to kind of transition. And we're really just pushing folks out. And, and the goal is to have the mix, right? A mix of a, of a corridor to have access to lots of residents. So what we were exploring is what are the frameworks or tools that have 
helped people stay in, in their homes, particularly if you know, they're renters or low income, and uh, still attract the investment and not have uh, people pushed out. So really creating opportunity to, to grow a community and help the folks within. Um, I don't know if you've heard the examples or seen some of the scenarios in, I think, the Bay Area, New York, where investments are coming into lower income areas, um, bike lanes, and you know all of these things that we're promoting, uh, our trails plan, connectivity for walking and biking. And for some residents, they often see that as a threat. So when, when we were having our presentation from Miriam Zook, she really helped us understand that it's, it's highly localized by place and being very intentional about how do you invest in a place and community that's already there. Um, and so there's lots of uh, examples that she's going to provide or she did provide in her presentation. So that will be part of it. But it was much more on a, a strategy side for that than a, a policy side. So James, I don't know if you want to, if I captured that accurately. Yeah, and I would say too, I think for all of you in this committee on the board through across the region, um, notwithstanding what the, what the pandemic and the economic aftershocks are doing to small businesses, right? Um, that you all are acutely aware of. But if we are successful in getting revitalization and investments in these corridors, many of these corridors have small businesses, um, you know, that are often locally owned, they're often owned by people of color, our small business numbers and the number of small businesses owned by people of color are, uh, they're very high in this region in general. And they are the wealth building engine for a lot of these communities. And I think um, we've heard from many of you that, you know, what we don't want to do is actually force those place, people out, right? Um, so it's on the residential side, as Monica was saying, but I'd also say, I think on the on the commercial and small business side as well. Um, if we get this new investment, we want to make sure that those businesses that want to stay, uh, that have a foothold in the community, that are that are that are the wealth building engines, um, are are not, you know, forced to leave. Yeah. Uh, so so when I heard the anti displacement strategies, I thought of many many small towns like my jurisdiction, we've got kind of an interesting thing happening where we've got kind of absentee commercial property owners. And, and I'd like to hear of incentives, ways that we can get these guys to either do something with their property or sell it so somebody else can do something with the property. I've got a prime corner in my, in my old town Auburn that's a vacant building and it's been vacant for the last eight to 10 years. And we can't get that family to do anything with the property. So kind of the opposite of the anti-displacement, um, maybe some tools can end up in this, in this toolkit that helps communities like mine entice folks to either improve their properties, do something with their properties, or, or sell them so somebody else can do something with the properties. Um, That's a Fantastic point, and, and it's certainly germane and actually one of the challenges in our Civic Lab Year 2 program that the city of Placerville was facing. And they had uh, over on Stagecoach, and they could not budge with this property owner. And when they held up uh, a workshop, and it was a, a specific large, large unit that they were trying to get addressed, everyone else around them raised their hand and were ready to go. So um, we can certainly uh, get an update on that and but definitely focus on that absenteeism. Um, and I anticipate post pandemic, the absentee landlord scenario challenge is only going to increase. Yeah, I would, I would agree what, what all of our commercial corridors look like after this economic crisis is over and this pandemic is behind us. Um, I fear they're going to be dramatically different. Um, last question I had. Sorry. I'm sorry, what? That was a big comment, but you have one more question. I apologize for interrupting. Uh, one, one more quick comment on the, on the, you were talking, I think, about fees, per unit fees or per square foot fees. Um, <clears throat> fees are such a significant barrier for 
for successful revitalization, redevelopment. Um, we've talked about the infrastructure limitations, but but those fees are are truly when we put performance together for developers looking to do a redevelopment project, that's where the project stops. Is it, it, they're just so high, so expensive. Um, so I guess I'm anxious to see what the task force comes up with as far as ideas related to related to fee reduction, fee deferral, any of those sorts of things that kind of help things, help projects get going. Yeah. Uh, direct, Director Tixa? All right, well, I mean, basically the comments or questions I had is, is similar to yours, because again, I, I feel like our jurisdictions are very similar, where again, we have, this is a highway project, we haven't seen that much development, we are awaiting, but even without the highway project, we have properties on the highway that are just sitting there empty. And the, the assumption, the funny assumption that some property owners have or some residents have that magically someone's just going to walk in and say, oh, I want to buy your property, but business there. Like for example, for Dutch Brothers, it was it took a few years, and that was the city kind of helped initiate and the property helped mm -hmm. initiate together to bring Dutch Brothers in. But again, that, that took somewhat years. And so I feel like this task force and the results out of it could be huge for, you know, cities like Auburn or Live Oak or Gold or whoever, you know, for anybody. And, and cause again, it's mentioned just businesses, it's, it's partially on the business owners. It's like, for example, like going back in the campaign trail, it's like reminding residents that our business is the long, one of the most lo long, longest surviving businesses here. And it's, again, it's like you can learn even from us how businesses can survive here. But again, it's just that initial process where people are just sitting and waiting and just hoping something can come. Well, it's like here is something that the city level is part of. Like, and I know with after COVID, it's just like, you know, we're able to have town hall meetings with some of these meetings, or maybe a city council meeting, someone can come in and bring these results to us, show our residents and show the property owners and business owners what, what they can achieve or what they can work with. So I'm excited to see, because again, with this new highway project, everybody's just waiting you know, for the results. Thank you, Director Pizza. And Any Director Spokely, to go back to your fees, the example that one of our developers gave specific to a project she is moving forward uh, the difference between her proposed project, which was 148 um, attached and attainable homes, uh, was a $3.7 million difference. Had she done single family detached homing on that, that same parcel, there would only be 25 units, but there was that significance of a difference. And their, her development firm is really passionate about working towards attainable and affordable. So um, we also got to hear, you know, multi over multiple meetings, the, the incredible risk financially that, you know, that burden and that finance falls on the developers. And the idea that through this toolkit, we can help to clarify, create transparency, remove the curtain. Oh, we have a director stander here. So this is Fantastic. <laughs> so I'll, doing a great I'll job. Just stop right on, Monica. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, Director Sander, welcome. Um, appreciate you taking the time to join us. Monica has done a fantastic job kind of briefing us on, on your uh, September meeting. Do, do you, do you want to say a few words? Uh, Monica, I assume you told them a, um, a toolkit of sorts is going to be the immediate product there was a little bit of discussion about what might come next so uh we would proceed to that toolkit and get more feedback from our group through uh the november meeting um forward that on to the SACOG board and then the question is well how do you best follow on to this uh one line of thought says maybe you tackle the agencies that often throw up uh barriers in front of infill development um, I know a lot of us have talked about that over the years. We've never in an organized way tried to facilitate or take that on. I think James could tell you that unofficially or maybe officially, uh, some of those agencies have approached him in the past year and talked about this very issue. So for perhaps what you do is you take a subset of this group or, or a different group 
and empower it next year to talk to Sacramento sewer district and the regional water agencies, um, et cetera, all those public agencies that we serve on but don't necessarily have as a priority infill development and talk to them and try to figure out how do we get them out of the way and even better supportive of infill as opposed to a barrier that gets it done. So that was one line of thought. The other big line of thought I heard was the need for education um, and telling our peers who haven't been privy to these discussions as well as others, even those in the development community who are not very proactive or uh, perhaps are so uh, risk adverse they're unwilling to consider infill like projects. Perhaps there's some sort of outreach education ongoing effort we can make to bring these projects up and show examples of success. Um, and in that context, you know, working with our Civic Year 2 group, I think, based on this toolkit and how to move forward with them on all those infill projects also makes some sense. So something in there, I don't know exactly what it is, the board will have to decide. Um, I think is worthy of further attention by SACO. Great, thank you very much, Director Sander. Um, any other questions from the committee members on this item? All right, I don't see any hands and I don't hear any other questions. Monica, Director Sander, thank you very much both for that update. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. I love the task force. <laughs> Great. Thanks, All right, man. we're going to move on to item number five, which is our Sacramento Regional Parks and Trails Strategic Development Plan update. And I think Victoria has this one. Hi, Victoria. Yes, hello. And I'm here to have a discussion with you about how we can address the opportunities and challenges laid out in the Parks and Trails Plan input and possible SACOG actions to support that as we move forward with the strategic development plan. So, so as to not tempt fate, I am going to uh, turn off my video feed while I'm sharing my screen. And I think that'll be the best outcome for all of us. So hold one moment while I'm sharing the screen. All right. And so we are setting out to identify our region's unifying vision for making trail connections and also to identify what is standing in the way of us getting there. We know that a connected trail network that increases access to open space for all of our residents, including those areas that have historically had lower levels of investment and where residents shoulder the negative impact of environmental environmental conditions in the built environment is an important part of how we move forward on connecting our trail network. And we know that we can also use these connections to increase physical health as well as mental health and that they can create options for safer biking and walking trips. In that where trails connect, supportive businesses can open to meet the needs of people who want to bike and walk more whether they are creating volunteer operated bike repair shops that are going to serve as the training grounds for future bike shop owners or future employees, uh, or whether it's the homegrown businesses that would rent out bikes to visitors exploring our region. And we also know that communities can really get behind these new opportunities created by the connections and they become a point of pride and what you would want to show off to your friend from out of town when they come to visit you. These are some of the topics we'll be covering. I wanted to do a bit more about why are we interested in trails? Uh, this is probably familiar information to everyone or at least one or another parts of it would be familiar to you. But we do look at what is the potential for us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, by completing a trail network or by expanding a trail network. How can it be used to increase safe active transportation connections? How does that reduce car trips? How does it increase access to jobs or to businesses? That last point about access to jobs and businesses also fits into how we can support our economy. Uh, you create access for people to get to those businesses 
but you can also attract in visitors if you're looking to expand your uh, recreational tourism economy. You can also reduce brain drain by creating some of those economic opportunities in place instead of uh, having people need to find them elsewhere. And you can also proactively design a more inclusive economy that would address racial and income-based disparities. And how all of these different parts collectively help to strengthen our communities by improving the health of residents, by proactively addressing the social determinants of health that make some people predisposed to different health conditions that then cause other vulnerabilities. How does it increase access to green space and how are these increasing the amenities for our residents? All of this to go towards an increased quality of life in our region that makes us a great place to live as well as visit. When we last talked in June, we were just getting a sense of trail access through the region. And we knew that uh, of the almost 500 miles of formal trails and informal trails that we have, about 48% would were within, 48% uh, of the residents were within a half mile of a trail of any length. And we use a, a half mile proximity to a trail because of some different studies that show your likelihood to use that trail if you are within a half mile or less. It greatly increases uh, when you're within a half mile or less. Uh, we also knew that less than a quarter of the trails were located in disadvantaged communities compared to 37% of our residents that live in the, in our region that live in MTPSES environmental justice areas. Uh, we also noticed that we had a lot of really small trails that weren't going to feed into a longer trail network. They were just micro trails that weren't providing the access and they didn't have the potential to grow into something bigger. And when we were looking at what, what access looked like when you focused on trails that were a half mile or longer, we saw a significant decrease in access for people living within a half mile and for also jobs located within a half mile of these trails. So we decreased to about 41% of the region's dwelling units that are living within a half mile of a trail. That's 540,000 households that don't have access. Uh, decreased 38% of the region's jobs. So over 660,000 jobs that didn't have access. And still around that 25% uh, marker where 25% of the trail mileage is located in disadvantaged communities compared to the 37% of our region's population. To recap, this is, uh, these are the different areas within our region that uh, meet the thresholds identified through the MTP SES uh, to be looked at through an environmental justice lens. So areas where the 45% or more of the households earn less than 200% of the federal poverty level, uh, block groups where 70% uh, or more of the population is a community of color, and then also uh, other measures that would contribute to a vulnerability of households such as concentration of older adults or uh, linguistically isolated households. We wanted to dive deeper into what access looks like for different areas in our region because we we saw that there was that disparity of how many of the trails are located within disadvantaged communities compared to where our residents are but also acknowledged that trails are very often being used to expand access into to green space and areas where uh, there aren't really any people living and therefore they may not have a people living there that would cause an area to be uh, evaluated with the lens of environmental justice. So we took a more focused look at, at uh, areas that have lower income households. So 
200% or lower the federal poverty level. So for a family of four, that would be existing on $56,000 or less a year. And when we took a more focused look on that, uh, that population, we found that they are about 30% less likely to have a trail near them than the households that are earning more than 200% uh, of the federal poverty level. So while we know that, so now we have it established that there is a lower level of access to trails, but we also know that from our MTP SCS analysis, residents of the environmental justice areas in our region are more likely to walk and bike and take transit than residents of the non-environmental justice areas. And without trails to serve them, the residents have no choice but to use the on-road networks that may be uncomfortable in a best case scenario or sometimes are unsafe. It is important to acknowledge that we have a changing plan environment that is going to provide uh, some opportunities for different projects that are going to that are going to look at how you can bring these assets to marginalized communities if it if it's well supported with uh, your outreach. Uh, for example, climate efforts that support car uh, carbon free transportation like biking and walking are prioritizing investments in marginalized communities. Uh, additionally, uh, at the federal level and the regional level and the state level, and as well as at some of the local levels, people are collecting better data that supports trail potential and connections. Uh, and that there's also an increased interest in trails and how they can strengthen or be a significant part of an all ages, all abilities network that is going to be inviting to, to people of differing abilities when they want to go outside of their house and enjoy a low, low stress environment. So uh, from these changing planning conditions that we have and uh, the elevation through different funding programs. We do have a couple of trails that will be coming online in the next couple of years. These are trails that are either fully funded through construction or near fully funded. And we're looking at 11 miles of new trail. There's one bike ped freeway over crossing that's in there. And collectively, these different trail projects are about $53 million worth. And so we wanted to see what that does to the, the existing access that we were talking about before. And it's creating new access for 15,000 households. Uh, so they will be near those longer trails and they currently don't have anything by them. It's creating new access to 11,000 jobs and it is strengthening the connections to existing trails, parks and schools for over 20,000 more residents who are living in our region's disadvantaged communities today. And it's also important to note that uh, of the $53 million that are going towards the completion of these projects, over a third of that funding is from state funding sources that would have otherwise not been coming into our region. you'll note that that's about the average cost of a new interchange, uh, although new interchanges can certainly go more expensive than that. <clears throat> so we wanted to uh, go, go over the local plans that are going to form the foundation of what we base this regional plan on. And we reviewed nearly, or nearly 80 plans throughout the region, uh, general plans, active transportation plans, regional trail plans, and at the suggestion of some of our partners, 
climate plans as well, examining the mission, vision, purpose statements, and goals, and other policy language as related to trail networks, destinations, and opportunities for connections. Uh, from this review, we saw that there were six, six goals that regularly rose to the top. Uh, safety is very frequently a, a cornerstone of any sort of transportation project that you could put forward. And given the intersection with uh, access to outdoor spaces and a low stress environment, recreation was also top of the list of one of the, the goals that we saw rising to the top. I, we also saw economic vitality rise to the top in several different ways, but most frequently it was referred to as a way to draw more people into the region, such as uh, creating opportunities for recreational tourism. Uh, supporting health was uh, something that was kind of tied in with recreation, although we heard some interesting input from our partners that I'll get to in a little bit. And it's also important to note that in uh, recent years has been more of a focus on the all ages and abilities networks. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but it's something that people of varying abilities and ages can comfortably use. And this is a change from prior approaches that focused on providing a facility that may only provide access for either a very confident biker or walker, or it might be used by people who had no other choices available. This is also an opportunity to give greater consideration to providing access for people that use mobility devices that have previously been under considered in how we approach some of our transportation projects. Uh, we also looked at what are the locally prioritized destinations from all of these different plans. And uh, there were several references to, we want to connect to these employment centers. We want to connect to these shopping centers. And very frequently, those are, uh, those are contained within that jurisdiction's boundaries. But we also saw that there was a very strong interest in how people could connect to the next community over. And that is probably uh, strongest in some of our smaller communities that may not have all of the services, all of the, all of the things that somebody could want in, within their jurisdictional boundaries. And maybe they have to go back and forth across jurisdictional boundaries or uh, to either access medical services or to, to get to the exact grocery store that they want. Or in the instance of some of the parks and open space that were, uh, that were named in these to get to something that is just such a dynamite destination that you are willing to travel a little bit to get there. So uh, starting in late June, we engaged with our different project partners. So staff from cities and counties, uh, public health departments, and uh, community foundations, community groups. And we shared this information on the goals and the destinations and access and invited them to share more information about the on the ground conditions. And from that, uh, we had that prior list of six goals that we saw continually uh, resurging in, our, in the local plans. And while it, it is still that safety is and should be a characteristic of all trails, uh, effectively everybody was in universal agreement on that. They thought that environmental justice considerations were supported and a higher priority than was expe expressed in the existing active transportation documents, some of which are over 10 years old. And they also speculated that it would probably now increase due to the social movements occurring. Uh, there was also a stated interest in improving safety and health in environmental justice communities, uh, especially given the, the intersection of active living and proactively addressing the social determinants of health. 
Also related to health, uh, people noted that so many people have been turning to biking and walking during COVID and that trail networks are a very important support for this movement. And while I mentioned that uh, when we're looking at the planning documents of how economic vitality relates to both active transportation investments and specifically trails connecting, uh, we heard a lot more different examples from local agencies and community partners about what economic vitality looked like for them. They found that there was that potential to provide increased access to job centers. Uh, it was supporting affordable transportation for residents. So speaking to how it can go towards a more inclusive access. And it also definitely encouraged tourism opportunities and the support of businesses that follow that to bring people in, but that it also had potential to serve a significant role as we're as we are going to have to embark on a recovery from COVID. And uh, we also heard a, a great deal about all of the tremendous recreational destinations that define our region and that people really want to showcase. Uh, not only are they the riverfronts and uh, the levee tops and just beautiful spaces that we have, up in the mountains, but there's also, you know, places like the Sutter Buttes. You're really not going to find that anywhere else in the world. So, and lastly, they talked about how the presence of the trail is not enough. The real value of the trail is going to come from the destinations that people can access from that trail. So how it connects to the jobs, resources, businesses, schools, basically how those trolls are serving an important transportation role. And uh, with every opportunity comes, uh, comes a challenge as well, sometimes uh, more challenges than opportunities because we're all thinking about how we're going to get this done. Uh, we heard that for many of these areas that there are planned trails and they're going to pass through uh, more established communities where people are already leave or living, that residents need to be meaningfully engaged in the trail planning early, especially in marginalized communities where either the city or the county might need to build a trusting relationship with the, with the residents there and see what needs to be done in there to address the community's needs. Uh, this kind of ties in with uh, some of the anti-displacement strategies that uh, Ms. Hernandez and Director Sander were talking about a little bit earlier, uh, but they are uh, better versed on it than I am. Uh, they also, our, our partners also mentioned that overcoming institutional barriers and the coordination needed with institutions that control the right-of-way can hinder the ability of any one agency to develop a corridor into a community asset. I, while Union Pacific is one of the, the common, commonly cited uh, difficult partners in that kind of story, there are also uh, comments about the difficulty in uh, working with multiple land or landowners in an area of reclamation districts and uh, any other sort of entity that may not be fully bought into what is a trail going to bring to this community and into this region. Uh, when there are institutional barriers, we can also look at what infrastructure barriers there are, the highways, the railroads, if you're crossing over a railroad and uh, the rivers that divide some of our communities double as the jurisdictional boundaries and others. I, we heard from people that they have shelved projects or just decided to not pursue them in the first place when they were setting priorities because they thought the project was going to be too expensive to pursue by themselves even if they thought there would be great benefits of doing that project. 
And it's especially true for smaller communities that rely on neighboring cities for critical services. And when you have one of those uh, infrastructure barriers that doubles as a jurisdictional line, that is going to make it even harder to tackle because then it's not just making it the priority of one agency, it needs to be the priority of two. And lastly, there was uh, the two-sided coin about how new developments are frequently designed with trails as part of them, but they also frequently miss the opportunity to connect with the existing trails around that area. So this is going to serve to isolate that community and it also undermines the potential for biking and walking trips to a store or other destinations that are geographically quite close, but you don't have the connections there to make it an easy to do thing. So I brought two different examples of these challenge scenarios, although uh, there are multiple examples throughout the region. These are just two, and I'm sure that many of you will see your own community in one or the other or both of these. So here we have one instance where if we were working towards a goal of increasing access for environmental justice communities, you can see that uh, the underlying layer is looking at population density and where are there a lot of people living uh, within this uh, disadvantaged community that don't have any trail access near them. And uh, for some of them, they also have significant barriers between themselves and the nearest trail. So there are planned trails on the ground, but it's going to take a, a lot of engagement with the people who are already living there to, to make sure that everybody can get excited behind a project and that it's going to embody their input. They're also going to have to deal with uh, some different trail crossings of higher speed higher speed roadways, higher volume roadways. Uh, there's also uh, at least one freeway uh, that these planned trails cross. And uh, like I said, the multi-jurisdictional coordination that's needed to make them happen. And with one of these specific examples, the uh, city of Sacramento was looking at what they could do to study one smaller segment of this trail. In, in this instance, would it make sense to try to clear the entire trail corridor at once, even though that involves multi-jurisdictional coordination? Would it uh, make sense to study the area as a whole and see which ones or which connections uh, are the, the so-called low-hanging fruit, even though uh, with this exact example, everything is going to be a bit challenging? So there's a lot of different things to examine of what could be done from a regional level to help increase access to residents in that instance. Okay, and then another example we have is uh, the challenge of connecting communities. So in this instance, we have two different communities with a stated interest in wanting a trail between them, uh, city of Live Oak, the city of Yuba City. But there's no planned connection between the two. There are a number of these different, what we've been looking at as opportunity corridors that are, uh, that when we look at local planning documents are pointed to as a, oh, you know, we want to, we want to look at inactive rail lines uh, to build out our trail network, or we want to look at the levee tops to build out our trail network. So in that instance, there are these different opportunity corridors with possible connections, but it's going to involve a lot of ongoing coordination with multiple partners, some of whom have been reluctant to discuss trails in the past. And this one also embodies that idea of trying to connect to some of the, the physical attributes that really define our region. Off to the west, you'll see the Sutter Buttes and there are different opportunity corridors as well as some existing 
trails that almost get you to the buttes where there are a number of different uh, riding groups that'll go. Uh, if you're taking off from the town of, Stu town of Sutter, there are different options for you to go on relatively low traffic roadways. Uh, but uh, the, the reports I've heard, it, it gets quite hot out there. So uh, that's going to be something that maybe could be addressed with some different uh, rest stations. But I mean, we're definitely not to that point yet. There's still not even the figuring out how do, how do you make that connection between these two communities that really want to make that connection. And so with those two examples, uh, fresh in your mind, I'd like to open up the discussion to these opportunities and challenges for your input on how to focus our efforts. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, let's see, who would like to start off with comments and questions for Victoria? Did it, did it care? Yes, go ahead, Director Tietze. Uh, yes, Victoria, I'm, I'm glad you showed the example with, uh, in our areas because, again, it's, the Sutter Buttes are routinely used for biking. And again, that is an issue. There is no less stop. It does get very hot up there. And that is that's some issues we have with some of the private landowners is that they like people going through but not stopping. And that's not one thing where if we can work with, with the local um, biking enthusiasts and the, you know the riding cycling groups work with them and the property owners and the same same thing uh but that little map there i had no idea there was a <laughs> there was an old railroad track like i've never seen that one before <laughs> so i mean it's interesting that we can convert that to uh the cycling lane and and what i'm asking is like What's the like the usual funding that JCOG uh, uses or or uh, disperses to agencies yearly? Uh, so the question is, what is the usual funding that SACOG disperses to agencies, and that could be used for those kinds of studies of what it takes? I, I couldn't hear the question, but that sounded like that's what Director yeah. asked. Okay. Uh, so SACOG uh, distributes different, uh, different federal funds mostly that are used for different transportation <coughs> plans. So within the frame of reference of what could we what could we distribute for something that is going to look at those connections? Uh, I would think that provided that there is a, an underlying transportation argument for it, I could apply to uh, any of the, the different programs that we would typically have through, um, through the competitive funding rounds. Uh, for the active transportation program round that we do, they, uh, it might be able to support some, some study within that, but it's going to have to walk a very careful line. You can't do feasibility studies with ATP funding, but you could possibly do outreach based activities if you were trying to uh, gain a line or gain enthusiasm with different uh, landowners throughout the corridor. And I'll pause in case anybody else has other parts to add to that. Not hearing any, we'll move on to other questions from the directors. Thank you. Director Frost. Uh, yes, Victoria, I, I'm interested in I don't know if you have information regarding this, but um, oftentimes we build this infrastructure and then we walk away and then we come back 10 or 20 years and it's time to update it. Um, are there, is, do we have any knowledge of 
ways that different jurisdictions are funding the ongoing maintenance of these types of um, trail networks, um, we have an amazing opportunity that could uh, potentially be great for the whole region actually and pull several counties together but um, for ongoing maintenance we don't even have enough for our roads so how do how are people the maintenance and upkeep on these trail networks i think that if we go back to the uh the february board committee workshop that we had with our guest speaker from Humboldt County. He had mentioned how it gets part of the development of their trail network. They also work to set up a foundation that could be used uh, to help with the continued maintenance of the, the trails, which some areas around here also have a, a Friends of the X trail where they either do volunteer days to, to help with some of the more frequent maintenance, such as uh, pruning, garbage collection, et cetera, but then also can collect funds to do more of the, the hardscape maintenance. But it's definitely an issue uh, that would need to be tackled because these are facilities that uh, they will last for several years, I think maybe 20 years if, if they're installed correctly. But, you know, 20 years will still pass and then you'll have maintenance to, to look for. Any other questions for Victoria? I've got a couple quick questions for you, Victoria. When, when, when we look at the access to trails threshold is there a distance that you're using to determine whether or not your you have access to to a trail system is that a mile is that five miles is it oh, we were looking mostly at or we were looking at a half mile in part because of you know the some bits of research that would point to a half mile being an indicator of how likely you are to use a trail uh, but also just to have one standardized unit of measurement. Uh, on the, we recognize that if there is something attractive enough, you'll probably travel further for it. But the further away you get, especially if you're getting further than a mile out and you don't have a comfortable connection to get there, you are going to be forced to drive to do that. And in a, in a region where not everybody has either access to a car or guaranteed access to a car, like maybe a household is sharing one vehicle. I feel it's important to consider that some people are going to be dependent upon uh, their own means to get to these trails. Right, I, so I grew up in Fair Oaks and grew up on the American River bike trail system and I lived a couple of miles from it and I guess that was an attractive enough amenity that I was on the trail almost every day riding my bike. So that half a mile threshold seems low, but I understand you're just setting a, you know, standardized distance and, and, um, and, and that's the metric that, that you've come up with. Um, the other, the other question I had on, on in this slide that you've got up is actually the one I wanted to, kind of ask a question about one of the challenges I've heard um, <clears throat> from some of my, you know, friends and some of my employees here at my office who are avid cyclists is, is um, when it comes to safety and, and those types of concerns um, with, with the increasing homeless encampments along these trail corridors, <clears throat> it's, um, it's, it's really starting to affect how, how much our trails and, and some of the more established trails that we have in our area get used by families in particular. Did that come up at all in your outreach with, with the various partners that you've been talking with? I'd say that it came up in one of the ways in which safety is considered, such as uh, whether you, 
whether you feel like you have personal safety when you're on a trail. Uh, there was also some conversation about how we can acknowledge the challenges that all of our regions are facing as we have uh, more people experiencing homelessness and how we can address address that and help those people who are uh, without homes right now and uh, do it with dignity for them. So it's definitely acknowledged uh, there's no easy solution in mind. Right, right. All right, Victoria, thank you very much for your presentation. I'll ask Lynette, do we have any public comment on this item? I don't see any public comment, but Director Gallo does her, her hand raised. Oh, Director Gallo. Thank you. Hey, we must have been neighbors growing up. I was in Carmichael and we'd have to get somebody to do with a truck to take our bikes to get us to the bike trail. That yeah. was always the challenge. <laughs> um, we had a unique opportunity. So we have a 20 year park plan in, in Rockland and a couple of years ago we had this unique opportunity of a failed golf course. Um, the owners took, took a few years, but we were finally able to get an agreement to buy the abandoned golf course. So we've got 180 acres dead set in the middle of Rockland. Um, again, it wasn't in our funding plan for our 20 year park plan. So it took everything we had, tree mitigation money, what we could do to purchase it. And we still have a couple years to pay it off. Um, but we just opened just half of the bike or the cart paths that were in good shape. And it's unbelievable, the response. It is as popular as it could be with literally nothing out there. The rotary has been putting some benches in, um, but just cleaning up the trees and opening what we could that we felt that was safe. But truly for a really small investment, we could open up the other side. And if we build just a little bridge to get across the creek, nothing crazy, but a walking bridge to get across the creek, it connects with Johnson Spring View Park which is our largest community park. And then if we can make a way to get across Pacific Street, we're connected to Roseville, all the way up to Citrus Heights, to Loomis on the other side. It's a, it's a way to move people who are working and going to school. Um, on the other side, very few connections to where we can make it to get people to ride their bikes to Sierra College. I mean, it's just the perfect setup. But one of the things as we started looking, I mean, one, it took so much to purchase the land, um, but we keep hearing, you know, it's only gonna be disadvantaged communities that, that have access to grants to make it happen. But I know I can get people out of their cars and, on, and off the streets. Is there any opportunity for communities that they are not considered disadvantaged to make that happen? Because I think it's, I think that's all of our goals is to improve the air quality and access and we can do it and with very little work. I think that for a number of different statewide programs, they do have targets of how much they're going to invest in an area or um, how much they would invest in disadvantaged communities, but it's a, it's, it's a floor, not a ceiling. And that for some of those, uh, some of them do max out at you know 100% of the funds, and others of them do not. So I th I think that there is going to be some different option for uh, like for some funding opportunities, but it is going to be a bit more select and few than you know the the wide world of state funding opportunities. I, one of the things that we do consider when we're looking at uh, how we allocate or how we uh, distribute the regional ATP funds is not just whether a project is located in a disadvantaged community, but whether it's going to provide a, a benefit to residents. And maybe the benefit is that uh, they're able to use it for the, the jobs connection that you're describing. So I think that I, both at the regional level and the state level, there's at the regional level for sure, and perhaps the state is moving there, there's a space for the conversation about uh, how we can look at system-wide uh, transportation 
options, uh, how we can look at a regional trail network and the benefits that that provides on a much grander scale than just the, the one space that one trail segment is located in. I think it would be a good conversation to include in um, some of the other opportunities, whether it's the, um, the CMAC fund for the air, air district fund, safe route to schools, all of those folks uh, would have, maybe that's a different way to, to look at it, to say, how can we combine this and really get some bang for our buck? I, I will tell you, I had an interesting thing a few years ago uh, in my day job as transportation director for Elk Grove Unified. Um, Elk Grove is about a third of Sacramento County. It's, it's the uh, 320 square mile district and it's very diverse and in geography and um, the, in our community. Um, we always measured whether you would get school bus service and, and California does not provide funding for school bus service. Individual districts have to do that on their own. And we always determined it based on physical distance. Are you a mile and a half or two miles from the school? Are there controlled intersections where you can cross? And, and that's how we always based it. Well, about three years ago, we had one of our disadvantaged community schools come to us off Florin Road and said, yeah, we're less than a mile and a half but we have challenges that aren't physical challenges. There are uh, a, a crime, high crime area, Stockton Boulevard and, and Florin were not great areas for kids to walk through to get to school. And so they came in the first time and said, we want you to consider other challenges. And those are really hard to define. And, and we always provided service on very specific guidelines, but it was one of the first times where, when students led that charge to say, we might need service for different reasons. Um, and so sometimes the very specific guidelines we have in place have to be re-looked at because there are, other, there are other factors. So I think that's for me, one of the things is I don't want us to get too locked down, have some guidelines, but also look and see how, who benefits and how can we benefit the most. All righty, Victoria, thank you very much for that update. Um, Dov, I've uh, taken a little bit of your time here. Sorry about that. We'll go ahead and turn this over to you for the state housing element site inventory guidelines for local jurisdictions. Dov? Sure, no problem at all. Good afternoon. And are you able to see my screen? Yes. PowerPoint? Great. Um, so I'll, I'll keep this a little bit shorter, but uh, you've been hearing from, from SACOG staff and um, perhaps already from your planners that the housing element requirements are going to be much more challenging this cycle than in the past. And as local elected officials, many of you are, are gonna have to make some tough choices between uh, now and May when housing elements are due. So today's uh, mini workshop will cover some of the key requirements and challenges that your individual jurisdictions may face in the light of a, uh, a guidance document that was released by the state in June. As you may recall, Lunar authorized staff to conduct technical assistance that would ease the burden on member agencies as they begin updating their housing elements. So we've done a variety of things on that front, including an ADU affordability analysis that our jurisdictions can rely on to, to assign their projected ADUs to the different RENA income categories. Your staff are tearing off of that work right now and uh, will not have to conduct their own analysis as a result. We're also facilitating a, a working group with the state uh, as well as some of the other large COGS to uh, identify and develop other efficiencies like the ADU analysis. So products that come out of that effort along with um, discussions of long-term RENA reform, which the state uh, will be looking at relatively soon, um, will all come through this committee. So having, having a strong policy understanding of RENA and sites inventories uh, will be key for this committee as those conversations move forward. The site cemetery is, is generally considered to be the most difficult and the most important part of a jurisdiction's housing element. This is where you demonstrate how you can actually accommodate your arena number. The general process actually hasn't changed in decades, but as the housing crisis has really reached new heights in the last few years, the legislature has made a series of key changes that will um, really impact the way your site inventories will look. Today, I'm gonna to provide a, a really quick overview of how a sites inventory works, and then I'll walk through four key takeaways from that recently released sites inventory guidance. If you or your staff are, are interested in a little bit more detail, we provided 
um, a four page synthesis as an attachment uh, to the staff report. And so those are the four uh, takeaways there. I'll go into those in a second. But first, just some basics here. The, the site's inventory is essentially the, the entirety of all of the housing capacity in your jurisdiction compared against your arena numbers. So in terms of what you can count, your pipeline projects, like the you know, units under construction, planned or approved, those can be counted. And you count those based on the expected rents or the sales prices, because you already have a project in mind and you kind of have a good idea of whether or not it's gonna be affordable. Non-site specific capacity in, in red there refers to housing that you can reasonably expect to happen over the eight year period, but for which you don't really know the location yet. And the, the biggest example here um, are ADUs, which are increasingly becoming a bigger part of the site's inventory. And again, you can use that, that SACOG methodology for assigning the, um, the income categories for that one. Vacant and underutilized sites are where most of the residential capacity in the site's inventory actually comes from. And it's where there are also the most requirements. Capacity in this category is assigned to the different income categories based on the allowed density, right? Because you do not have a project that you can sort of point to and, and guess the affordability for. And we talked about this a little bit um, when we were going through the RENA methodology process, but for these, the higher the allowed density, of the site, the lower the income category it can accommodate. So they're using um, the allowed density basically as a proxy for affordability there. And then finally, you can also count sites that you commit to rezoning as a part of your housing element, uh, which you may need to do if, um, if, you, if you don't have enough capacity to actually meet your arena based on your existing zoning. So in the, in the hypothetical example there on the screen, city has arena of about 100 units split between the income categories you would first remove those pipeline projects in, in orange based on expected rents. And then you would make an assumption um, for the number of ADUs that will be built. In this situation, you're allocating about half to the lower income, half to the moderate. And then for the remaining 60 arena units, you would look for your vacant and underutilized sites and then assign them to the income categories based on allowed density. In this example, even after accounting for all of the existing capacity in the jurisdiction, there's still a five unit deficit in that lower income category, uh, which means that a rezone is necessary. So the green line there um, is just a hypothetical rezone here. This would be like if you change the zoning on a commercial site to allow for um, high density residential uh, and it created 20 units of lower income capacity and that ensures that you have a surplus in all of the categories. So jumping now to the takeaways, the first big takeaway from the guidance is that the statute is increasingly looking for, for more analysis to justify assumptions in the site's inventory. And the intent is to ensure that, you know, should a developer come forward, there isn't something uh, obvious that's holding these projects back. And this is particularly true, the state is really looking for analysis for uh, small sites that are less than half an acre and for non-vacant sites. And for these types of situations, you really do need to provide a good amount of evidence that the site is indeed available and likely to redevelop. In terms of that, what that evidence looks like, uh, past experience is always best. They will pretty much take it as long if you have um, examples in the past um, in that zone. Uh, of course, that's not always available, right? So when that's not available, the state is looking for evidence like favorable site conditions. So maybe, you know, a low existing floor area ratio um, where there's just not a lot of building on the site, a lot of sort of vacant space. Maybe the, uh, the structure to land value ratio is low, which is an indication that the site might be underutilized. Maybe an old building uh, or sort of a, a rundown building um, is another indication. Market interest is another one. Um, and that could be interest from a developer um, to actually buy the property, or it could be from the property owner to actually sell the property. Um, you could also have like neighborhood development trends that sort of indicate that there's a lot of churn happening in the neighborhood and it's on a right for redevelopment. And then you can also provide economic feasibility as well. So if you have some sort of, you know, um, crude sort of economic feasibility work that shows, look, there, this site is really sort of um, uh, right for redevelopment and, and the economics are sound for doing that type of project, that would count. And then finally, uh, housing element policies and programs. 
Um, so these are also things you can use as evidence. Um, and, and a common example is if you're counting a lot of small sites in, a, in an area, um, if you have a program in your housing element that, that makes it easier um, or, or, or um, streamlines in some way lot consolidation, then um, that can sort of be used to bolster your argument to use those sites. So takeaway two, realistic capacity assumptions require more sites. It used to be that if you had a, a two acre site zoned for 40 units an acre, you could assume like the theoretical maximum of 80 units on that site. Now you have to really adjust for what is actually realistic. So for example, say the zone allows for 40 units an acre, but then you, you typically get projects that come in at 38 units an acre or 95% of the max. You would need to actually multiply by 90 95% there. And then similarly, you might need to multiply by 90% to account for a utility easement that's on the back of the site that's making that 10% undevelopable. Or say this site is in a, a mixed use zone that allows um, standalone commercial. You would need to account for the chance that the site does not actually develop as residential at all, right? Because that's definitely possible in those mixed use zones. When you account for all of those adjustments, the realistic capacity on this example site is more like 50 units than 80. And of course, right, the big result of this, this realistic capacity assumption is that it's gonna require more sites to actually get the same capacity that, that you used to get. So takeaway three, reusing sites requires buy right processes. It's pretty, it's pretty common for jurisdictions to try to, to reuse sites that didn't develop in previous cycles. Um, there was a lot of concern that a new rule that went into place this last year was going to prohibit reusing sites from the last cycle. That is not true. You can absolutely reuse your sites. However, you do uh, need to now make the site by right. And we talked a little bit about this before, right? The difference between a discretionary process like the one on the left and then a by right process like the one on the right. And the state is looking for that by right process because they want to ensure that um, you know, if a site isn't developing over multiple cycles, it's not because of a, a burdensome development review process. Okay, takeaway four is about over-concentrating sites. And in an effort to, to affirmatively further fair housing, which is a term you might remember from uh, when we were going through our arena methodology process. We were, um, had a requirement on SACOG to do that. Um, local governments also have that same requirement now as a part of housing elements. So in an effort to affirmatively further fair housing, local governments are required to actually analyze their sites inventories to make sure that lower income sites are not um, over concentrated in an already poor and, and highly segregated area. If they are, you would then need to identify sites in high opportunity areas to, to rezone so that the zoning isn't perpetuating racially segregated neighborhoods and that really that lower income households have an opportunity to move to places with lots of jobs, with good schools, with low pollution burden. Okay, so I appreciate everybody hanging in there for that. I know that can get uh, pretty wonky, but Hopefully that information was helpful for understanding how these sites inventories work and you know, what the big changes to the process have been. We continue to work with uh, and meet with all of your planners on a regular basis to work through some of these challenges that we just discussed. Um, this presentation is part of the direction uh, from this committee to delve into some of the, the bigger housing issues facing our region. We're talking today just about housing elements because it's such a live issue, all of your planners are currently working on housing elements, but uh, we do have other topics planned for later this year, uh, including one exclusively on ADUs that's coming up. So with that, happy to answer any questions you might have. Job, thank you very much for the presentation. Nice job on the timing. Um, I, I've got a couple of quick questions. Um, ADUs, obviously, you know, with the, with the governor's um, orders on, on the ADUs and, and making those um, easier for um, homeowners to install those on their, on their properties with reduced setbacks and different things like that. Just because an ADU is built um, and it's called an ADU, we still get to count that 
towards our arena number? Yes. Yeah, so, so any, I'll draw a, a, a small distinction between there's sort of this exercise that your planners are going through now of creating your housing element and sort of looking forward for eight years and then seeking compliance from the state. Um, and then there's also a separate sort of exercise of throughout that eight years, you're sort of counting units every year and saying your progress towards your arena, right? So yeah. for both of those, you can count ADUs. In terms of progress, you know, when an ADU comes forward and it's permitted, um, you would put that in your annual progress report. And um, based on the expected rents of the ADU, um, you, could, you could say it was counted towards this income category. And so you're able to count that, that progress. You're also um, uh, allowed to, to make a projection of how many ADUs you're expecting um, for that eight years and count that projection as a part of your housing element update, um, which is a, a big one because um, you know, the, those changes that you referenced, they're making ADUs a lot easier and we're seeing a big uptick in ADUs. And so you can really, um, you know, depending upon the jurisdiction and sort of your past historical trends, you can really kind of knock out a chunk of your, your projected arena through this ADU component. And just for reference, statewide about 10% of all permits now are ADUs. Um, it hasn't quite hit that level in our region yet, um, but we are expecting a jump because of those changes to state law. Great, thank you, Doc. Um, the, the thing that kind of concerned me in your presentation was the, the realistic capacity assumption. That, that's a brand new thing? Uh, yes, well, yes. It, it's gotten a lot more stringent in the past two years because of, of Bill 1397. So, so who comes up with those reductions? Um, one of them was a 75% reduction. I mean, you're, you're looking at a piece of land that, that is just being zoned um, to, be, to be high density and, and you have no idea what a layout, no idea where the utility easements are gonna be. None of that information is available. How, how, how do you, who comes up with those, with those reduction values? Yeah, so you're, you're hitting on a really key question that I think um, the state has really, <laughs> frankly, been sort of struggling to try to interpret. They sort of got handed that, that language in the, in the legislative bill. And so they've been um, having a few workshops to try to work through exactly what those things mean and how they'll be interpreting them. The, the, the short answer to your question is uh, you as local governments will be coming up with those numbers and then the state will basically be saying whether or not they, they sort of agree with your assessment. Um, so generally the, the advice that we typically give our, our local governments is to um, just make a, a reasonable assumption. It doesn't have, you know, I don't think anyone expects you to be 100% right on for every single percentage, um, but make a reasonable assumption and then back it up with some sort of rationale. Um, and I think the, the realistic capacity component um, was really put in there. The intention behind that was for the situation that I mentioned where um, you have sites that are zoned mixed use, right? And it could totally happen as a commercial or it could totally happen as residential. Another situation very common that jurisdictions will use is a housing overlay. So like say it's a, a, a industrial zone, but then you have a housing overlay that allows um, high density residential. Um, and it used to be you could just, you know, assume that you could count all of those sites, but I think the state was seeing, well, there's no, there really is no guarantee that that happens as residential, right? And so maybe we should kind of be a little bit more realistic about how many of those sites um, will actually develop as residential. Uh, but it is a difficult sort of subjective exercise, as you're indicating. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Dov. Um, anybody else have questions for Dov? I see Director Gialdo. Thank, thank you. Um, also on the ADUs, I have kind of the similar question. As we were going through our numbers, uh, the, the requirement it said on ADUs is somewhat based on your past experience, but that's not even remotely close to what our, our new experience will be. I think we looked and we had like two ADUs previously. We're looking at about 5% of our number will be ADUs because of just the interest that we're getting and then also seeing what's happening with the applications just in Placer County. Um, but I'm concerned that you're going to say, oh, well, based on your last year, that's not going to happen. But 
we didn't have the requirements in place to allow them before. Yes, so um, in all things housing element, if, if you make a assumption um, and you back it up with, with some sort of rationale and, and data, typically the state is amenable to that. Where, where, they, where they will push back is if you say, well, 20% of our arena will be ADUs, um, you're just gonna have to trust us. Um, so as long, again, as long as you have, like, if you have a lot of development interest, if you've had a lot of applications in the last year that you can sort of point to, I think that would go a long way. The other thing I would say is that there is a safe harbor that they've um, said that um, you can count uh, five times the, uh, the ADUs that you permitted pre-2018 when a lot of ADU laws went into effect. So there is a safe harbor if you don't have the time or the resources to do some sort of extra analysis, you can rely upon that. I totally recognize the challenge in a situation where if you had one ADU, right, five times that is yeah. it's not a dramatic increase. Um, <laughs> so I think you might be looking to do some, some other sort of exercise that points to just like the very recent interest and uptick that you're seeing. Yeah, because I think that's, we'd want to, we think we might get more, but we're going to say 5% of our numbers. Um, but still, that's a significant, you know, that's going to be like 150, and we had two before. Um, but we think based just on the interest and the calls, and like I say, we're, we are not getting the applications quite as, but all this, because people are just figuring out that they can. So um, we expect it's coming, though. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions for Doug? All right, thank you very much, Doc. Appreciate that report and that workshop. Um, we are running a little bit long on time, so I apologize to everybody for that. Uh, James, do you have any anything you want to state or mention to us before we wrap things up? Okay, I want to thank. Sure, All right, thank you, James. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, if if it's all right with the group, I'll go ahead and adjourn this meeting. Everybody have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank Thanks, Lynette. Thank you.